Thank you for joining me for Lesson 9 in this series on the book of Proverbs. It is an amazing book of practical wisdom that can enrich and help us lead more successful lives before God and within our community. In our previous lesson, we studied briefly the structure and literary techniques of synonymous and antithetic proverbs. It was my goal to give a few tools on how to identify and interpret them. In this lesson, I want to focus on two additional categories of proverbs, the synthetic proverb and the better proverbs. Let's begin with synthetic. The word synthetic comes from a Greek word meaning skilled in putting together or combining. For the purpose of our series on Proverbs, synthetic means combining separate elements to form a coherent whole. We observed in our previous lesson that a synonymous proverb consists of the first line making a point and the second line repeating it using alternate wording. The additional description in the second line is intended to expand understanding and provide more clarity to the principle being made. Antithetic proverbs are constructed differently. The two lines of the antithetic proverb state truths, but the first line contrasts the second. The student of wisdom is expected to gain greater understanding by identifying and weighing the differences presented. Synthetic proverbs are also designed differently. They combine the first line with the second line in order to complete or teach a single principle. A couple of examples of synthetic proverbs are chapter 10, verse 18, which says, Whoever conceals hatred with lying lips and spreads slander is a fool. And chapter 11, verse 31, which teaches, If the righteous receive their due on earth, how much more the ungodly and the sinner. Notice both lines of each synthetic proverb are needed to complete their point. Sometimes a truth is made in the first line of a synthetic proverb, while the second line adds an extension of the truth, an application, or even a warning. An example of such an extension of the truth is a synthetic proverb found in chapter 15, verse 3. This proverb says, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. The second line extends the point made in line 1 perhaps even including a warning to the student of wisdom. In this case, the second line explains what the eyes of the Lord are doing. An application of the truth can be seen in the synthetic proverb found in chapter 14, verse 27. There the scripture says, The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. Here is a practical and spiritual application of God's blessings to those who fear the Lord they escape the snares of death. A strong and clear example of warning in the second line of the synthetic proverb is found in chapter 16, verse 5. It says, The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. In this sense, the proverb warns the student of wisdom to be humble or else suffer the consequences that God will bring to the proud. According to my calculations, synthetic proverbs make up the second largest category of proverbs. Only antithetic proverbs are more in number. I find 163 synthetic proverbs. That is 30% of the 530 proverbs in the book. Synthetic proverbs are scattered throughout, but the largest concentration, about 100 of them, exists in chapters 16 to 22. Let's look more closely at some synthetic proverbs. The first one I want us to look at is found in chapter 16, verse 7, where an amazing principle is revealed. The proverb says, When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies live at peace with him. When you consider what this proverb is saying, it should qualify as one of the most intriguing proverbs in the entire book. Let's focus first on the word peace. There are two kinds of peace in this proverb. The first is most important. It is peace with God. A man whose choices in life lead him down a path or lifestyle that is pleasing to God must do so according to God's spiritual guidelines. The relationship between God and the faithful, obedient servant is one of peace. This concept is the basis for the term 
atonement referred to in the Old Testament. This kind of peace is the most important of all. It is personal. It is spiritual. It is internal. It is eternal. The peace that God brings for the faithful amazingly extends beyond their spiritual relationship. This proverb teaches that God blesses the faithful with human peace that can even change their relationships with enemies. God will create an atmosphere of peace around His faithful that takes away the dangerous hostilities of enemies. The proverb does not say how this peace will come about, and human experience would suggest peace with one's enemies does not always come easily or quickly. The important point for us is that divine intervention for peace is possible for those whose ways are pleasing to God. In the Old Testament, God's favor of bringing peace between enemies is illustrated in the story of Isaac and Abimelech in Genesis chapter 26, verses 26 to 31. Because God blessed Isaac in such a way that even unbelievers could see, King Abimelech of the Philistines was anxious to make a covenant of peace with Isaac. Genesis also tells the story of Joseph. He experienced troubled relationships with his brothers when he was young to the extent that they sold him into slavery. Joseph spent a long time in slavery and was alienated from his brothers and father as the story goes in Genesis chapter 37 to 45. However, God's hand of blessing was upon Joseph to enable him to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh and oversee the gathering of grain before the days of famine. Joseph's rise to power by God's blessings enabled him to reunite with his brothers in peace and save his extended family. Joseph realized God's intervention and said to his brothers, God sent me ahead of you to save your lives by a great deliverance. Genesis 45 verse 7. That God can bring peace between his people and their enemies is clearly understood by Solomon. As he dedicated the temple to God, he prayed for Israel Forgive your people their sins and all the offenses they have committed against you, and grant them compassion in the sight of their captors, so that they may have compassion on them. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 50. Solomon enjoyed peace all around him through the blessing of God, as is recorded in 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 24 to 25. His own personal experience enabled him to write this truth into this two-line proverb. Another synthetic proverb I'd like to dig into is found in chapter 16, verse 33. It says, The lot is cast into the lap, but every decision is from the Lord. Notice the first line describes the casting of a lot for making a decision. The second line emphasizes that every decision or answer of the lot is from the Lord. The second line extends the teaching by providing a word of caution that what may appear random is still in the control of God. Casting lots was a common way among Hebrews for making important decisions. Small pieces, similar to our modern-day dice, were given meanings of yes or no and then cast for their answer. The Bible records several historical decisions made by Lot. Remember the promised land of Israel after the conquest was divided by the casting of lots in Joshua chapter 14, verse 2. This process determined the geographical location of each tribe. Another important decision includes Samuel helping Israel select their first king. Saul was chosen by lot from among all the tribes, clans, and warriors in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 17 to 27. And another important selection made by casting lots was the selection of Matthias as a replacement for Judas among the apostles in Acts chapter 1, verses 12 to 26. A rationale for casting lots in the Hebrew mind is described in Proverbs 18:18. 18, 18. Casting the lot settles disputes and keeps strong opponents apart. Thus the word lot, or phrase one's lot in life, came to mean one's destiny. Line one of this proverb refers to throwing the lot into the lap, but the Hebrew word literally means fold in the garment or bosom. This probably refers to a fold of garment or purse or piece of material into which the lots were cast. It does not necessarily refer to the material purse of the high priest's breastplate described in Exodus chapter 28 verses 15 to 30 where the Urim and Thummim were kept. 
The point of this proverb is similar to chapter 16, verse 9, which says, In his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. We can plan something, but it is not within our power to bring it into effect without God. Casting lots was a Hebrew way of acknowledging that God was in control of everything. Let's look at one more synthetic proverb found in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 21. It says, The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but a man is tested by the praise he receives. A crucible is a container or vessel of metal used to hold heated substances at high temperatures. Sometimes it is a hollow area at the bottom of a furnace into which the melted metals collect. The use of a crucible and then furnace suggests the silver and gold are being heated to the point of melting. This melting process could be for molding or shaping the precious metals into usable instruments or jewelry, or the crucible and furnace are used to purify the silver and gold. When they are heated to high temperatures, the impurities in each come to the surface. There they can be seen and removed. This heating process creates the purest silver and gold. It is the way we refine gold and silver. Metaphorically, a crucible can mean a severe trial or test. This fits with the idea of testing the purity of the silver and gold in the crucible of the furnace. This concept seems to fit best with line two where a man is tested. In this sense, as silver and gold are tested to see what they are made of, so a man is also tested. The twist to this proverb is the instrument for testing a man. For gold and silver, it is the crucible and furnace. For man, it is the praise he receives. Now, everyone appreciates a little praise for a job well done or for a particular act of kindness or help. But the wise men of Israel also knew that praising someone, especially too much, could become a trap. Egos swell and pride grows. Excessive praise or the need for much praise demonstrates an impurity within the man. Praise becomes a crucible or furnace that heats up the soul and tests each person. How a person accepts or seeks praise will show their true character. Praise will make impurities come to the surface, just as it does in heating silver and gold. Of the proverbial categories studied so far, we have seen the use of additional description, comparison and contrast, and an extended explanation to teach a principle. Better proverbs are easy to identify because they all start with the word better. For the student of wisdom, better proverbs give two conditions and then state which one is best. In this way, teaching is accomplished by prioritizing to show or illustrate which is superior or better. The student doesn't have to judge for himself. He is told which is best. As students, we are expected to understand and accept the better Proverbs and incorporate the stated higher values into our lives by giving them preference, recognizing their greater quality, and seeking to live by them. In this sense, comparing or contrasting different conditions is accomplished, but an additional ranking is given to the situations listed. This technique provides a value to the principle being taught. There are only 14 better Proverbs found in the entire book. That's only 2.5% of the 530 Proverbs. Only the seven numerical sayings make up a smaller proverbial category. Eleven of the better Proverbs are found in the literary unit 2, chapters 10 to 22, and the remaining three are found in unit 5, chapters 25 to 29. Remember, both of these literary units are attributed to Solomon. The 14 better Proverbs fall into two distinct groups. The first group compares and ranks two different conditions and states which is better. There are only two Proverbs like this. The second, larger group of 12 Proverbs is more complex because it contains two sets of conditions that are ranked. I'll explain this group in a minute. 
First, let's turn our attention to the two examples of better proverbs that rank two different conditions and see if we can grasp the teaching technique incorporated in them. The first better proverb we will study with two conditions is found in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 12. The scripture reads, Better to meet a bear robbed of her cubs than a fool bent on folly. The mention of a bear is meant to be humorous in this proverb. Bears were considered dangerous, and especially so if the mother bear had lost her cubs. She would be extremely angry and ready to attack and harm anyone or anything she met. The physical harm would be great, maybe even to the point of death. Some people may remember the story of bears killing the children who ridicule the prophet Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. The fool in his folly would be a foolish, ungodly person acting out his foolishness. He would be acting without reason, without God's guidelines, and at the height of his wickedness. As he acts out his wickedness, he would be potentially dangerous physically, but definitely dangerous spiritually to anyone who crossed his path. Proverbial wisdom teaches that a fool will come suddenly to ruin, disaster, destruction, poverty, punishment, and shame. No one would want to be around him when this happens. There is a greater danger. For Proverbs, the fool is spiritually condemned. Encountering a fool bent on folly would not be a spiritually healthy place for any wisdom student to be. Better to encounter the bear who can only hurt you physically rather than the fool who can bring physical and spiritual ruin. Another better proverb ranking two conditions is found in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. The proverb says, Better a patient person than a warrior, one with self-control than one who takes a city. If you look closely, this proverb says the same thing in both lines using additional descriptive words. It could qualify as a synonymous proverb except for the fact that it begins with the word better. In this proverb, a patient man or one with self-control is better than a warrior or who takes a city. Most people read this and agree and move on without thinking about how it is true. So let's stop for a moment and study this proverb. In most cultures, warriors and those who take a city are considered heroes. In the Old Testament times, such warriors end up as kings and natural leaders of clans and tribes. In modern times, successful warriors often become presidents of nations. Yes, people respect a patient man, but everyone wants to be a warrior hero. In fact, there is even the possibility that a warrior who takes a city must also be a patient man to wait, work, and eventually gain the victory. So how is the patient man better? Let me suggest that a patient man and the warrior are both conquerors. The key to this proverb is what is being conquered. The warrior conquers others. The patient man conquers himself. The characteristics of the battle are also important to this proverb. Consider the location of the battle for each. For the warrior, it is a city. For the patient man, it is his own heart, mind, and attitude. One is an outside battle. The other is inside. Consider also the duration of each battle. The warrior fights for a few months, maybe a few years. The patient man will wage his war for his entire life. The warrior can lay waste an entire city, never to rise again. The patient man will always fight to control himself. His battle never ends. In God's eyes, and indeed in the eyes of the wise men of Israel, the patient man is by far the greater warrior. The second, more complex group of better proverbs contain two sets of conditions. Both sets of conditions seem easy to identify the better choices, but the proverb strives to accomplish something else. It seeks to prioritize which of the two betters is of the highest value. In order to do that, the lesser value of each is exchanged, making two new sets. By doing so, 
the two better conditions can now be evaluated in a different light and ranked accordingly. Most often, a bad spiritual condition is grouped with a good physical condition, and a bad physical condition is grouped with a good spiritual condition. This allows the proverb to prioritize a good spiritual condition as greater than a good physical condition. Through this unique literary technique, the student of wisdom can learn that it is better to be lowly in spirit along with the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. Proverbs 16, 19. Other better proverbs fit this same structure. Proverbs 15, verse 16 lists wealth and little and fear of the Lord with turmoil. Switching the lesser of both conditions allows the proverb to conclude better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. Another better proverb compares a fattened calf and a small serving of vegetables with love and hatred. By switching the lesser of both conditions, the proverb is able to teach better a small serving of vegetables with love than a fattened calf with hatred. Proverbs 15, verse 17. Again, two conditions pair righteousness and injustice together with much gain and little. By exchanging the lesser of each, the proverb emphasizes better a little with righteousness than much gain with injustice. Proverbs 16, verse 8. This exchanging technique for better proverbs allows the spiritual condition to be valued or ranked above all good physical conditions. This is how 12 of the 14 better proverbs work. Let's look a little more in-depth at a couple of examples of this more complex better proverb. The first is found in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 5, where it says, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Some people might be confused by this proverb, perhaps even argue with it. I mean, who appreciates rebuke? Let's first identify the two conditions being grouped together. Open is better than hidden, especially in wisdom literature. Evildoers are secretive and hide their plans from others. The righteous and wise are open and public. And for the second set of conditions, love is more highly valued than rebuke. But what happens if love for another is never expressed? If love is never extended? If someone never acts upon their love? The one who is loved wouldn't know. He or she would go through life without the slightest idea that someone loved them. In fact, it might even be considered cruel to withhold and hide love from another. Withholding love certainly breaks the second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, as it is in Matthew 22, verse 39. Let's consider also the word rebuke and what it means in Proverbs. Rebuke is one of those words that fit into a cluster of adjectives in Proverbs intending to describe fully a certain concept. Rebuke fits into a cluster with other words including teach, instruct, correct, discipline, admonish, and rebuke. In Proverbs, A rebuke is given to teach the right path and correct a wrong path. At its heart is love for the one being rebuked. Remember Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12? My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father the son he delights in. In this sense, open rebuke a correction or discipline based upon love that is expressed, is much better than love unvoiced, not acted upon, never seen, and never experienced. Our last better proverb is located in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 9. The scripture says, Better to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Oddly enough, a similar proverb follows just 10 verses later in chapter 21, verse 19. This principle says, Better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and nagging wife. Then again, the proverb in chapter 21, verse 9 is repeated exactly in chapter 25, verse 24. Three times this principle is repeated in the span of five chapters. I don't know a single wife that thinks these proverbs are humorous. 
I also think most people don't get past what seems to be a jab at wives to figure out what the proverb is really about. Let's break it down some and see if we can uncover the point being made. First, let's see that if we can determine the two sets of conditions being discussed. An obvious one is where to live. The choices are in the house or in the corner of the roof. If you remember, many houses in ancient Israel had flat roofs for storing things. Living on the roof is certainly worse than living inside the house. But what is the second set of conditions? Many would turn to the wife and suggest it has to do with her. But how? I think the key is found in the word share, as in share a house with a quarrelsome wife. This gives a beginning for unlocking the passage. Without mentioning the pairing of conditions in the first line, the proverb suggests the idea that the husband is living on the roof by himself. Alternately, he could share the house. But this pairing provides a problem for students of wisdom. The proverb seems to be choosing solitude over being together. And that is not exactly a biblical ideal from as far back as the garden when God pronounced it is not good for man to be alone. Genesis 2 verse 18. To me, the main point of the proverb is more subtle, yet consistent with proverbial teaching. Rather than focusing on a quarrelsome wife, this proverb is underscoring the value of living in peace rather than in conflict. The student of wisdom is to choose peace over conflict, even if it means living in the corner of a roof. The wife is not intended to be the focus of the proverb. The quarreling is a troubled relationship in this case between a husband and his wife, becomes the focal point with peace being the better option. In other words, peace is the best option, even if it means having to live on the roof than sharing a beautiful house where there is conflict. Obviously, a corollary teaching could be made that wise men and women will seek to make their relationships peaceful and full of joy rather than quarrelsome. If this concept is hard to understand, then let me point to another better proverb that makes a similar point more plainly. It says, Better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 1. Living in peace is highly valued in Proverbs. Peace, both spiritual and physical, begins with a healthy fear or respect for the Lord that brings us to obedience with His laws. That obedience translates into being a good neighbor and living in peace with family, friends, and community. I find better Proverbs fascinating because of the structural technique of exchanging the lesser conditions to rank or value the spiritual condition of the physical. I find the teaching technique of placing greater value of one thing over another extremely helpful in building a set of guidelines or principles to live by. For me, this category of Proverbs is fun. I hope you've learned something new about synthetic and better Proverbs. I also hope this study is making you want to learn more about the, one of the most fascinating books in the Bible. May we all grow in wisdom. Until next time.